शशि गुप्ता लिविंग इन जेटल बन। I'm extremely delighted to be associated with the release of शशि's book on the Indian Mujahideen, the enemy within. I've had the opportunity of reading an advanced copy of this book, which was sent to me. And a lot of facts and details that I went through went far beyond my own knowledge and assessment. The book not merely contains uh, extensive details of uh, how the network of this organization has spread, the kind of uh, incidents that they've been involved with, and the potential for sabotage and assault that they really have. I have not the least doubt that uh, it must have taken Shishir a lot of effort and industry to collect all these facts and put them together in a book. There are, amongst the many that we know, some in the media whom I always regard as the foot soldiers. They not merely analyze, but you can always see them going from office to office, individual to individual, collecting details, compiling facts. And then even when we have an opportunity to discuss with them, their information and analysis uh, adds to what we already know. And undoubtedly, Shishir has been one of those whom I've always described as one of the not so many foot soldiers in the media scene who are active today. I think the genesis of the problem that you discuss really has its roots, not within but externally. We have a state uh, on a western border which really never worked on a positive agenda. The India obsession was always there. Whether it was in terms of Kashmir, whether it was in terms of uh, other things that's happening in India. And I always see this one fundamental difference where the need for transparency, democracy, openness, economic growth, <coughs> improving the quality of life, adding to what the state already has. These have been the agendas into which we have gradually evolved. But it is this India obsession which actually prevented a large number of these things happening across the border. And therefore this obsession initially started off with what we used to call cross-border terrorism. I recollect that about a few years ago, we very proudly used to say that uh, even though we have a terrorist problem in India, it's essentially cross-border. And we don't have domestic homegrown terrorist groups. India didn't produce a single one of its own domestic Al-Qaeda affiliates. Now this was true some years ago. I think a realization set in, particularly when they were involved in this whole process <coughs> of using terror as an instrument of state policy. You had the Taliban in, the, in Afghanistan being uh, actively supported by their official agencies. And I don't think it's a fact which can be now seriously denied after Abbottabad and after the Chicago trial. The distinction between state actors and non-state actors in Pakistan has clearly got obliterated. You then had a situation where the need to support this by local activists was there. Initially, it was those providing logistical support every time an attack took place. But that situation has far changed. We can see in Kashmir that in addition to the cross-border attacks, this whole institution of uh, stone, stone throwers actually evolved to give the world an impression that even if the world doesn't have a global appetite now left to absorb terror, well, these are protests taking place within. 
even though the wires were linked to what was happening outside. Similarly, you had the, the LED, which was created essentially for India-centric activities. It got found out, action was taken globally, then you had in various forms, the JUD, the Huji. And then you had the armed wing of the CD. When we succeeded in taking action against them in terms of ban and declaring them unlawful and the global uh, oversight on them increased, that's when the local Indian Mujahideen was born. Now it has its roots completely, it appears apparently to be homegrown, but it is externally ex inspired, externally supported, and almost externally created. That's the roots of the organization. And a large number of events, uh, incidents taking place, attacks taking place, gets linked to them. Their capacity to absorb within the local population is also very large. And therefore, the agencies, whether of investigation or of prior intelligence, also have a serious amount of difficulty in dealing with them. There are times when we have succeeded in investigations, there are times when we don't succeed in investigations. How do we then deal with this situation? These are not agencies that you can say you must engage with them. You can theoretically say that we must improve the level of social contentment in the Indian society. But then when these are insurgents who have taken the law into their own hands, they get funded from all over. And I think this is a question that the Indian state really has to address on a broad picture. I always ask myself a question. Why is it that after 9-11, the United States was never attacked again? But this hasn't happened with us. Is it that they have better intelligence? Is it that they have a better security apparatus? Or is it that the determination of the state, the political will of the state. And when I am referring to the state, I am not merely referring to a government in power. That is, each and every aspect of the Indian state has that political will as a nation to fight these kind of activities. Every time an insurgent is arrested, you suddenly find on the electronic media sympathetic notes coming from some section of the earth. It's not without reason that I find that the Maoists that you referred to, Shishin, just now, the groups which support them, the groups which support the, the insurgents in Kashmir, and some of them who support organizations like the Indian Mujahideen, you find the same persons inevitably trying and defending and rationalizing their cause and trying to justify that they are not involved. Now, I think we need a huge political will as far as the system is concerned. National security can be dealt with only on considerations of national security and none else. Unless we accept this. And that's why I find uh, not only in relation to the Mujahideen or any other form of terror organization or any other violent or insurgent organization, when we find, I refer to sympathies being created in a section of the media or in a section of the intelligence here, I've also heard tones of this kind in judicial pronouncements. In fact, some of them recently, which have come up, not only I disagree completely with the judicial or the legal rationale stated in them, but the kind of ideological rationale almost justifies why these things do happen in a democratic society. Now, I think collectively the Indian state has to decide whether we need a repetition of these incidents or we need a system or a society which is always able to fight this and once and for all we get, uh, we are able to capture the problem and are able to succeed because this is a battle that India can never afford to lose. I think Shishir's book gives us a lot of information which will make us ponder how do we deal with this. I have not the least doubt that you have, uh, by this very industrious uh, activity that you have uh, undertaken, the more it sells, 
not only is it better for you or your publishers, but it's probably also an opportunity for many in the society to read it and then ponder how you deal with this issue. Thank you. I wish you a book all the best. I'd like now to ask Honourable Minister, Mr. Peter Rampan, to say a few words.